Welcome everybody and thank you for attending this new lecture from the Fabrica Creative Labs series. My name is Loredana Rigato and I'm talking to you from Fabrica, a communication research center based near Treviso, Italy and created in 1994 by the entrepreneur Luciano Benetton. For more than 25 years, Fabrica has been training hundreds of young creative talents from all over the world who are invited here with an art residency to develop projects in the fields of video, design, graphic design, advertising, editorial, digital. It's a great pleasure for me today, for us, to welcome a dear Fabrica friend, Bradley Hassi, an American-Italian film director and a screenwriter. Brad was invited in Fabrica in 2006, and during his residency, he developed uh, projects uh, uh, like uh, short films, uh, advertising campaigns, and awareness spots. And after his experience in Fabrica, Brad returned to New York to work uh, with global brands like MTV, Yahoo, Listerine, and Duracell, among others, on uh, advertising campaigns and uh, short films. And with uh, renowned international uh, musicians like Moby. Um, when uh, um, um, the main topic, uh, sorry, for today's lecture uh, is uh, uh, Songs for a Sloth, which is uh, uh, his first feature film that he's realized with a very low budget. But I don't want to take any more time and I leave the word to Brad. And uh, if you want to uh, ask him questions, you can always uh, use the Q&A section of Zoom. Enjoy the lecture and uh, welcome, Brad. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for uh, having me here. It's nice to virtually be back at Fabrica. Um, so I'll jump in. So thank you for the introduction. That kind of talks about my background. Again, how I went to Fabrica. And after Fabrica, as mentioned, I focused on commercials and music videos. And behind me, you can kind of see kind of the style of what I do. Um, it's all comedy. There's a lot of props. Um, it, a lot of absurd characters, uh, but it's also joyful. And when it comes to the longer form stuff, especially this feature, I hope it also has some heart to it. So the idea is to entertain, have some fun, do some ridiculous things, and at the same time, uh, hope to uh, make people happy. Um, in 2019, I set out to do my first feature film. And on that, I was the director, co-writer, co-producer, and editor. And I'm gonna show you a quick trailer, it's 90 seconds, from Songs for a Sloth, so you have a better idea of what we're talking about. Hey, how are you feeling? Maybe you'd heard I had a breakdown, which I assure you I have not had. <laughs> what are you oh! looking at? <laughs> okay. I kind of disassociated very briefly after my father's passing. Your father named himself the chairman of the North American Sloth Fund. You're gonna need to add another $10,000 to the fund by the end of this month. But I'm fine now, 100%, ready to go. Here we go! Are you serious? What's the difference? Hello, I'm crazy, oh, gotta show you how. I'm doing it. I am not gonna let you die. How can I help? Tell me, please. Play your part. Please, please, please don't let me die. So I do want to raise the money for that sloth fund, you know? I wrote a song for the fundraiser. So will you guys help me? Will you help me? Would you guys give me a hand? I feel like you're losing your mind. Hello, everyone. We are live. <laughs> Maybe he would still be here if you took better care of him. No, guys, guys! What do you want to do, Max? Who are you? I mean, if fun closes, it goes back into public land and, like, put a strip mall on it and the sloths are gone. You aren't trying hard enough, Maxwell. Don't let me die. I never really remember the words after that. So that is the trailer to the movie. 
Um, now some quick background on the movie is this. Um, we set out to make this movie on our own. I'll get into the reasons why later. Um, all in all, everything all in probably costs around 60,000 or so. This includes production, post-production, all the legal fees and lawyers and setting up uh, a business for the film and promotion, film festivals, all those things. But the production itself just costs around $20,000. And a lot of times when you hear about these movies like the Blair Witch Project or the Brothers McMullen or these independent films, they'll throw out those numbers and they'll say this film was made for 20,000 or 15,000. That's the production. But then in post you go in and there's a lot more to finish it and things like that. So that's a first bit of advice if you're making an independent film is know that this the cost balloon uh, very much after you're done with production. There's a lot more there to be done. Um, we were lucky enough to do a successful Kickstarter campaign, which covered uh, most of the cost. Um, that that helped out quite a bit and if anyone's watching who donated thank you for all of that we do appreciate you uh helping us make this uh project come to life um one of the things about a feature film you need is you need a way for people to see it and the easiest way for that to happen is to have some celebrity talent that's not always easy to come by um we had a, gro clo a close group of collaborators working with each other but we were lucky enough to have a uh, arian moyad come in and do a day play for us and play the lawyer in this. And if you watch HBO's Succession, you'll see him on there. Um, and then at the end of this film, I also found out, uh, I was kind of thinking, okay, now what do I do to get this out there even more? And I realized we have a puppet speaking here and we could redo the voiceover for this puppet. So we set out to find a celebrity for that as well. And I was happy that we were able to get Jack McBrayer to come in, who you may know as Kenneth from 30 Rock, to play the voice of our puppet. So that helps out a lot. Um, and so kind of showing you a little bit here. So this was our Kickstarter. Um, from there, you're able to do, uh, get some press. That's Jack McBrayer joining our cast. Um, this is the official poster. Lorenzo Fontan from Fabrica also created this. And then there's some different iterations of it. You see, we got to some film festivals and from there, you're able to hopefully get out and get more people to see it. Here's some quick behind the scenes of our small cast and crew. Um, so the biggest difference with a project like this versus like other commercials and stuff that I do is when I do other commercials, you have resources to get things done. And on a film like this, it's just you and your collaborators and you guys have to get everything done. I'm gonna show you very quick, a couple of things of how it works in the commercial world where normally there might be like 50 people on set. If you're outside, you have trucks blocking up the whole street, you have resources for everything and budgets. Um, and you have all of this to help make a 30 second spot. So here's some behind the scenes from some commercials to show examples of that. Um, here's one, for example, where we wanted an old looking bank and we could not find one. So we found a train station, this is in Vancouver, and we ended up turning it into a bank. So here you go, you have a lot of uh, cast and crew in here making the changes, and then you're able to make the final spot. Psst. Hey, guys. Hey, blockchain, you work here? Do I look like I work here? Um, and then here's another one where, for example, you're doing a commercial and you say, we want to shoot in a basement, but you can't find any with good lighting. So you make that basement. And in this case, we were uh, in Toronto, coincidentally also Canada. Um, and you can make it to spec as you need, and you have the lights you need and the space you need and everything, and you're able to bring that to life. So again, you want this and you're able to go ahead and build it. Um, another example here, we had this gag for Duracell. This was shot in London, where the guy's on a motorcycle crashing into the garage. So this is the final commercial, or not commercial, this section of it. So that's a section of it. In order to pull that off, we're able to do, you know, build stuff like this. So on commercials, when you're in pre-production, you are thinking, okay, how do I get this thing done? There's a motorcycle, they're riding it, what do I do? And you think, well, we'll uh, take some equipment, we'll pull this all together, we'll put the, the motorcycle onto a track and everything gets done. On an independent film like this, that's not possible. So you really have to come up with different ways around it. Um, I'll show you really quick a behind the scenes here of a scene from Songs for a Sloth. And at the end of this clip, you will see our crew. Get out of my way. Go 
go that way. Very mature. Very mature. Pretty cool. Max. Max. So there you have our crew. A handful of people. There are a couple more people here and there. Um, but for the most part, you can see uh, what a tight group this is. Um, just a quick background on the people involved. Um, I started off with myself and Richard Holman, who he also starred in the film, co-wrote it, and co-produced it as well. And then from there, we were able to get a cinematographer on board, Andy Whitlatch, and uh, our gaffer slash DIT slash everything, Kevin Deming. Uh, Grayson Ross from Pudding Boy Productions came on board and was the executive producer on there. And then we had many other people uh, helping out as well, um, running in different parts of the, of, of the film and everything. But it was a really, really small group of us. And on the film side, we also wrote this in a way where we're like, okay, let's make sure this is a small cast as well. So we ended up having just a few people. So Rich, like I said, one of them, uh, Brian McCarthy is another character. Ava Eisenson plays another character. And then, like I said, a day player or two, and then the voice of the sloth. So it's a very, very, very small project. Only a handful of people are on set all the time. Um, we did this all in 11 days on a single location. Um, with a very small budget, again, to kind of mimic some of the films, the first films of people like Robert Rodriguez, Edward Burns, the Duplass brothers, uh, Lena Dunham, all of them did their first films with these very, very, very tight independent budgets. Um, and so there's a lot to learn from this, and that's what I'm hoping to uh, share today, give you some information on how we pull this off, and hopefully you could kind of use some of this if you're looking to do your own film. Um, five things to discuss is one, set a date, and I'll go into depth on all these topics. Two, write a script that you can shoot. Um, it's not a matter of just pulling a script off the shelf and being like, let's make this for a micro budget. It needs to be tailored to the micro budget. Uh, work with a close team, stay organized, and test, test, test. Um, so before I get into the first one that I mentioned, set a date, I want to establish one other major thing. And that is um, something that came from a speech by Mark Duplass at South by Southwest a few years ago. And the speech could be called, uh, the Calvary is not coming. And it's a great speech to look up and I'll send, I'll give you a link at the end of this. Um, trying to break into Hollywood is a huge battle. You hope you make one thing and then from there you get to do the next and the next. And then what you're hoping to have happen is once you put in all that work, Basically, the cavalry or the army, they show up behind you and they're like, congratulations, you did this one thing. Now we're going to help you. You could relax, you could focus, and we'll take it from here. Oftentimes what happens then is at that moment, you are sort of waiting around for the cavalry to show up and do the next thing. You get a lot of promises, lots of meetings. And what ends up happening is you wait year after year for those to come true instead of continuing on on your own path and continuing to create. So the whole point of the speech by Mark Duplass is to say, do not wait around for that. If you make your first film, set out and make the second film and the third film and the fourth film. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon. The cavalry is not showing up to help you. You will basically be there on your own with your friends making films time and time again. So do not stick around waiting for that help, just keep on going. And I think that this could be applied both for, you know, if you already made a film and doing it, but also for the very first project. Um, don't wait around to make something happen. Just go out and do it. Maybe you made a short film and you're thinking from here, I'll get permission for the feature film. Um, but that's not the case. You need to just keep on going on your own. And yes, one day people will show up and help you and get you to the next level. At that point, take that and you know continue on your path and grow as a filmmaker or as an artist. But until then, do not stop. And that's kind of the point. Um, so the first topic I brought up is setting a date. Um, I've heard this many, many times before, and again, this is something that can be applied to any creative project, I believe. Set a date, a, a feasible date, something that you can actually accomplish, and stick to it. Tell your friends, tell your collaborators, we're doing this on this date. In our uh, situation, it was March in 2019. We had another opportunity fall through with financing through a smaller studio. Um, and then someone I just worked with tipped me off to this thing called the 90 Day Movie Madness Challenge that Stephen Norrington was starting. and Stephen. Um, if you don't know him, is a director, and he did the movie Blade and a few other projects like that. Um, and so he had this thing going on with a group of people saying, okay, 
we're gonna do the, we're, everyone's gonna shoot their own movie in 90 days, uh, write it, direct it, produce it, and then finish it and deliver it. And so I called up my writing partner, Rich, and I said, let's just do a film this summer. We'll start in July to meet with this deadline of this competition and let's go for it. And he said, okay. So we didn't have a script yet. This is mid-March. We're gonna shoot in July. That basically gives us three and a half months to write. And now one more thing about this competition, the award for the competition was nothing. It was just simply a group of people coming together to try to make something and, and inspire each other. And that's exactly what it was. And in the end, I'm proud to say that uh, it was a difficult task, but we actually did accomplish it. Uh, we did not write it within the 90 day period, but we did do everything else and got to our finished edit close to that 90 day period. Anyways, so we set up this date, um, we have a script and we're saying we are going to, uh, we don't have a script yet, but we're gonna shoot in July. And something interesting happened here. I always heard before about this thing with the deadlines, and I do it also with clients. Every time I have a commercial client and there's a deadline, I get the job done. I get the work done always ahead of time, and I do well with it. But on my personal stuff, my personal screenplays and stories, it goes on and on and on, and I don't actually hit my personal deadlines. And when I was doing this and I realized I was going to direct this movie in a couple months that we were writing in that moment, everything on the page was coming to life. So as you would write some dialogue or write some characters or some scenarios or put some props in there, I could see it in my head and go, I'm actually shooting this thing. It's not just a theoretical document that I'm gonna to show to some people, but in fact, this thing we're going to do. And having that shift and that belief about this film uh, helped out a lot. And I realized when it, the commercial work, that was the same thing. It wasn't just a deadline that made me go, okay, now I can, I will accomplish this. It was the idea that this thing will actually get made. And so everything that I'm planning is there for a purpose. It isn't just some exercise in futility that you think, okay, I'm doing this, but nothing will happen from it. So that was an important thing. Um, and let me show you again, some behind the scenes here. Um, so we had this idea that we were going to film. And then we also set many dates before the big date of actually filming. We said, we're gonna do some table reads. At one point, I think we had a week out from a table read and we had about 20 pages left in the script. Oh, I'm sorry, only 20 pages um, in the script and we had a lot more to do. Um, and so the actors were showing up and it was so tight that Rich here, this is at his apartment, um, he was even finishing the script bef like minutes before we got to our little small table read. Um, and also shout out to Rich because in that time, he definitely was the one that cranked through the most on the writing there. I was focusing more on some producing stuff and story outline, and he was actually putting uh, words on the paper. Um, so here we are in his apartment, small cast, us hanging out, reading the script. Maxwell holds the camera and Barney stands in the office. What are you doing? What is this picture? I'm looking for my favorite pen. <laughs> How would anyone know that's what's happened? Oh, what if I made this face? That's, that's what you look like when you look for a pen? What about this one? You look like you're being executed. I don't know, you said to do office stuff. Uh, so that is, that was the very first time. And so when I was at Fabrica, um, Babak Payami was the head of the film department there for a while, um, a great director, Iranian Canadian director. And he gave me the advice, when you write a script, read, read it out loud, record your voice and listen back to it. Now that's like the smallest step you could take. And so something different that happens when you actually hear the words out loud. Um, so even if you don't have anyone else, you could do that on your own. You read it out loud, record it and play it back to yourself. And it helps you understand really how this script is turning out. In this case, of course, with the table read, you have all the actors there, it comes to life even more. And you can see um, how finally this thing is even coming more to life by doing that. Um, second part I wanna bring up is write a script that you could shoot. Again, like I was mentioned before, many people just kind of think, okay, I've had this script, I've had it for many years, and now I want to turn around and just make it. And that's not really how this works. Uh, there's a couple of books that I read kind of leading up to this, one being Rebel Without a Crew by Robert Rodriguez, um, who did El Mariachi and eventually um, a few other movies in Spy Kids, and uh, I'm going blank on the one after El Mariachi. Um, and then also Independent Ed by Edward Burns, who did like uh, uh, the Brothers McMullen, which is an independent film. Um, and like I mentioned, some of the speeches there and also Lena Dunham, who 
you know, from the TV show uh, Girls, uh, her first movie was Tiny Furniture. Um, so all of them had very practical things to say about how they did this. They all did minimal locations, and we did that. We wrote a script with only one location. They had minimal shooting days, and we did that. We shot this in 11 days. They had a very small cast and crew, and we did that. Our main cast was three people with a few day players here and there. And when it comes to props and all these things, it was all things I knew that we could accomplish. So we set out to write something that we know we could actually shoot. Now, it sounds like obvious advice, but again, many times that's not how people go about doing this. Um, here we go. And so here we are at uh, our home. Um, and other things too is that as in with you know writing a script that you could shoot another thing is kind of going with the flow and when you find things that could help you out uh, utilize that and help that make it feel like it's a bigger project for example we showed up at rich's house and his mother does these wonderful paintings and they were all over the house and there was nothing about this in the script um, the script did have to do with a father that passed away and so we looked at all these paintings and said, wow, what a wonderful gift. We have this house with all these paintings. We could use these paintings and rewrite the story around it. So now we have set pieces, these props that we have access to that makes it feel like a much bigger project. If we would have written a script saying, and then we get a ton of paintings in here, that would have been impossible to do with our basically no budget and lack of time and things like that. But we had them all there. So we write it in the script. We change the story around it. And all of a sudden, we're able to have this great um, set piece there. Same thing um, in the end of Act Two. We wanted a big moment to happen, wanted to feel kind of bigger and a bigger climax. And we decided that you know we could throw a banquet, a huge banquet full of tables, chairs, balloons, all these things. But then, as a story point, nobody will show up. So all of a sudden, with a very very low cost, getting production central. Uh, tables and chairs and just going to any store and grabbing some simple props, it feels like a bigger thing. And then when nobody shows up as part of the plot point, it becomes even even a bigger uh, point for the story. And so you can see here. And then at the end of it too, there's a lot of destruction. He's able to break everything there, but again, we're able to do all this right. Right. Okay. Just without just spending a lot of money. You. What's the difference, all right. huh? All right. Come, all right. on. Come on, here we go. Are you serious? Max! What's the difference? And another example of that is, this is us doing a quick test shoot. Hey, what are you doing? Hey! What is this? That's a test shoot, and we had the scene where the very beginning, uh, they're digging out in the dirt. And in the screenplay, we just wrote that. But then on the day of shooting it, I think it was, we were scheduled to shoot it in the morning. And it was sunny in the afternoon, the rain was coming and we rechanged our schedule around so that we said, okay, let's shoot this scene in the rain. It'll be that much more dynamic. Here's this guy on the edge of losing his mind. Now it's pouring rain on him. There's full of mud. He's super dirty. And now everything happens in a much more dynamic way. And again, if we would have written a screenplay around this and said, it's pouring rain, da da da. Yes, we could pull it off with an independent budget, and yes, we could make things happen, but it would have been very, very difficult to do on 11 days, and it might have been something too, too stressful to kind of pull off. But all of a sudden, this gift is there of rain, and we decided to do it, um, and it allows everything to be much more dramatic. Um, and as luck would have it, um, halfway through it, it stopped raining, but luckily at that point, we already had most of our wide shots done, and then we had to come in and uh, get a hose to actually finish this off we'll be able to, uh, to finish that scene in the rain. Another quick look at the behind the scenes here. Um, next tip is work with a close team. Um, Rich and I have written with each other for quite a while. He's in some other short films that I've done. So we had that chemistry there and that history there. Um, Andy, the DP and Kevin and also the producer, we all worked with each other in different ways. Um, so we all had a shorthand already when we came to set. And then Rich, he brought on a lot of people that were his friends that he's either worked with or known for a long time as the cast. And this is our very first time at the location all together. <laughs> hey! Is this, 
this, we're doing the DVD extras first. Yeah, cool. that's it. I like that. If we get that done, at least we have a... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that a Brad? Yeah, that's a Brad. A speckled Brad. It's a speckled. <laughs> a white-haired Brad. Hello. This is awesome. Hey, buddy. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Hello. How's it Hello. going? <laughs> Good. Good right. to see you again. Good to see you. How's it going? Good. So that was a little take on us all kind of showing up and having the chemistry already built in. Making a film is super, super stressful every single day and night. You don't get much sleep at all. Um, and so then having everyone there kind of knowing each other ahead of time helps out a lot. The next point is to stay organized. Um, and I know that probably the most boring thing I could possibly do during a presentation, an online presentation, is show you spreadsheets. So I will breeze through this. My, my only point in bringing it all up, though, is that you need a method to stay organized throughout this. Um, when it comes to screenplays, um, the way that pages are broken down on something with like Final Draft is it's by eighth of pages. So I took all my exports of each scene out and I put them in a spreadsheet. Uh, let me, I rearrange this, I could rearrange this so that it's by the scene number. And then here's the page length you see right here. And I, I translated that into uh, decimal points so I could add it up. And basically what I did here is this allows me to see, and I did a, a pivot table. So it allows me to see every single day how much we're gonna shoot in a way on the sheet. And this way, every single day that I came in, I could understand, okay, so this is what we have set up. We did a breakneck pace of trying to do roughly around eight to nine pages per day, some a little bit less, some a little bit more. Um, but overall, we were trying to do a ton of pages a day. And by being really organized like this, we we're able to come in and always knew where we're at. And so other things we did to the spreadsheet is that there's big descriptions here. You can see here on the left, once we had it all set up, um, we were able to see what we're doing. So everyone was always, always on this. Everyone was able to see what they were doing every day when they're coming in. We did not have a first AD. So this helped us stay on track there. We had all the dialogue and stuff in here. And also another one that corresponded to this was the wardrobe and the props. The ones in red are here, ones that I could not get ahead of time, the stuff that we had to basically finish the morning of or order. So basically when you're running around doing this film, going crazy, running from scene to scene, trying to catch something before the sun goes down, you are gonna do things like make a mistake, like forget what the proper wardrobe is. Then you shoot it and you get into post-production, everything's done and they're wearing the wrong shirt or holding the wrong prop or something like that. And it ruins the entire scene. You can't edit it and it's all trashed. So doing something to stay organized is, is crucial. And you have to do that to make sure that you're always able to come back to something, have reference to it. And the way I like to put it, whether it's like this or commercial production, I always say, I have a Bible that I set up it's finished and ready. And if I get hit by a bus before the shoot, someone else could take this and still direct the whole project. Um, and also with that, I did something else, not just that nerdy spreadsheet, but also um, an emotional sheet that I set up. And I can show you here. So basically the whole script we wrote in eight sequences and you can see how that breaks up here. So like act one had uh, the first two sequences um, act two had these four sequences and then act three had the last two sequences. And then I made this nice board like I was going to a science fair project um, where any time, because when you're filming, especially in an film, independent film like this, you're always bouncing around. So throughout the entire project, um, you're going from one scene to the next to the next. So motions are all over the place in the screenplay. So with this, anytime we were shooting something, we can come back to it and we could see where we were supposed to be at emotionally. And so it was a reference point for people to come back to and say, okay, so for example, in the very beginning, in this sequence, Max is all frazzled, trying to deal with his father's death. Uh, Barney is a bit aloof. He understands the big moments, but the more nuanced stuff he can't catch on to. Um, when Jenna comes into play, she's supportive, but also wants to kind of keep her distance from them. So that was that. I was super excited by this. I spent a lot of time on this. I didn't get any sleep the night before. We did not use this one time, <laughs> but I'm still showing it because throughout this process of it, I think between me making it and really defining every single moment that had to happen throughout this film emotionally and sending it to the cast and crew ahead of time and then looking at it, even though on the set we never looked at it, I know that for me um, in particular, it helped out tremendously because it internalized everything. I knew where it was at. Everything's had a deep dive. I, I analyzed everything in a deep dive way. So by the time we started shooting, we were able to uh, 
really focus on everything and know that everything was coming together. Um, and lastly, and one of the biggest points I want to bring up is testing, testing, testing. Um, I listen to a ton of podcasts and try to get some practical information about how to make films like this. And I've heard uh, many times from Pixar that they have the Pixar method. And basically that could be summed up as um, them having a brain trust where they have all the different directors in a room and people bring in an animatic for the film that they're working on for one film. They show the entire movie. And if you don't know what an animatic is, basically it's like a dumbed down version of the film. You have like the storyboards. It's not really animated, but you might have one storyboard and then the next and the next, you kind of get the idea. There's voiceover in there, sometimes music. So basically it's like a version of the entire film, but done obviously much cheaper, much easier. Um, so they watch this entire film the brain trust comments on it. The team goes back, makes changes from that feedback, uh, makes another version of the animatic. Later on, they do this again and again and again. And it's kind of like if you ever saw a movie and say, I thought it was a great movie, but if they would have done this differently, it would have been much better. This is an opportunity for someone like, for a group like Pixar to, to actually get that to happen and do it over and over again until they have the most perfect film possible. I've always wanted to do this with a feature film, with a live action film, and we kind of did our own method with that. That said, before I get into that, I'll also show you how I apply that method to commercials and music videos that I do. Um, and I also want to mention uh, another person from Fabrica, Alex Healy, when I was there, he was also in the film department. And on the very first commercial that I directed there for the World Health Organization, um, we were prepping for it and he was insisting on us going out and doing all these tests and things like that. And I came into it a bit naive and young and thinking a director is someone that shows up to set and is out there and has this big personality and is able to figure everything out and that's kind of it and that i come to find out is not where most of the work done most of the work for a director is done in preparation before everything is shot so with alex for example we went out there we went to the location the night before we were shooting story we were kind of reshooting our storyboards with it and rethinking through things and had it all prepared so a lot of this comes from him as well let me show you some examples, though, of commercials. Um, sometimes on certain commercials with like tight timing, I will literally shoot the entire commercial from beginning to end with like an iPhone. Um, it's it's horrible looking. It's nothing that should be shared wide, widely. But this is a test that I did to look at the timing of things for commercial for Alka-Seltzer. And there's no sound on it just kind of roughing together. I want to make sure all of the timing is there. And you'll see here, there's a gag. I even cut to a totally different location. It's not about making this look perfect. It's about having uh, the right timing and things like that. And then this is how the final commercial turned out. Another example is this is this does not have to do a story, but this has to do with kind of the setup. I was doing a project with Joe Secchi's. Um, we were going to build a stage in Texas at a football game at a tailgate party, and we were not sure how this stage was going to feel with people on it. We have wonderful mock-ups like this, but we weren't sure exactly how it really feel once we get real people in there. And by the time you show up to set, of course, and travel in, it's too late to change that. So what I did in my backyard is mocked up the entire set to scale. Um, since there was just me there, I photoshopped myself in and built the entire thing like this. So this is in uh, the backyard. And yes, I think my neighbors think that I'm crazy uh, as I do a lot of things like this. And then you saw in Photoshop, um, I kind of finished all up. I had the measurements in there. Um, the main talent was much taller than me. So I actually blew myself up to make sure that it's the right height. So you're able to see the proper representation of how it's gonna look. And then this, here's a quick clip from how that came to life. You think you know football? How many players are on a college football team's roster? Oh, pick me. That is correct, Monterey Jack. So you're able to take a mock-up like this, do a real-life mock-up like this, and then you see the final here. And everyone feels much more comfortable when you're able to actually show them these tests and things like that. 
lastly, I will show you um, a quick clip of music video that we did at home uh, with my wife, who's a musician. And these are our kids in the clip as well. And it's something that ended up becoming a collaboration, an official collaboration with uh, Playmobil. And we did this, this for this last Christmas. So we were working with miniatures and toys and trying to figure out how to jump between um, the, the real world and the toy world. So I did a quick test to kind of show how this could work out. I wish I could see a lovely face. You see me labeling on the bottom here, which one it is. And then this is the final. I wish I could see a lovely face. And then here's another one where we have to do a cheat where we're in this the living room here. But we need to turn around by the window. Back here. So you'll see in the test, I have all these notes everywhere saying this table is a piano and over here is the tree. And this is how it's gonna be cheated over. Here's the final of that. I can find peace of mind in these memories of mine. Ooh, if you alone. I guess I should mention my wife's name, Violette, um, who wrote that song. Um, so that's it. So I do a lot of tests before commercials and projects and music videos, and this was no exception. Um, we did this here as well with the feature film. Um, so what I did, so in order to do this thing that I heard Pixar doing for live action, we did many table reads, which is nothing new. People do that quite often, but I wanted to take it one step further. I got the cast, the, the, our main cast of three on location, and I took a little point and shoot camera and I filmed the entire movie in a couple hours with them, uh, straight through from beginning to end, basically. So we'd be on the location, we get a little idea of the blocking, but I just did one single wide take for each scene. And later I was able to push, put it together and we basically had, we had an entire movie. It's a really bad looking movie and nobody is off book. Everyone's reading scripts and it's just a single wide shot, no props or anything, but at least story-wise, we're able to look at this and understand what we have. So here's one clip from that. And action. Right, it's like if you give them a glass of water, but what if the water is what they're choking on in the first place? You can't give them another glass of water. <clears throat> hey, um... So that's it. So a little clip, and that's what each clip looked like. And I brought those in to post, just chopped them up, had them go back to back to back, and all of a sudden I had a full movie. Um, and, you know, again, one thing, too, to bring, to bring up about, like, the table reads is when you do stuff like this, everything comes to life more. For example, there's a lot of music in our film, and here's Rich actually playing guitar at a table read. Enemy. It's no conspiracy. We do it to save energy. Don't let me die. And that's a lot more exciting than reading music on a page. So again, a table read is very important. Um, but so I'm going to show you now what we learned from this. And with this, I'll also kind of tell you uh, different tenets of storytelling that, um, that help out. And so with this, every time we do a new read, the script evolved and got better and better. So here is a table read from the very, very first version of the script. Um, and this is where Barney, the character right here, um, who's trying to ask our protagonist, Maxwell, um, if uh, if you'll help out for this project. Why won't you do this with me? Do what exactly? There's no way we're going to raise 30K on a Kickstarter in a week. Not with that attitude, Barney. So again, by the time we got to our test shoot, um, that story did not change. Then let's just do this. Do what exactly? A fundraiser. So we still haven't learned our lesson, but then when I took that back, I realized, oh my goodness, um, our main character, Maxwell, is very passive and he needs to be very active. So he needs to figure out, we need to get a way for him to be more active, trying to get people to do things. So our method of doing that was to have him take that storyline point and be the one asking everyone else for their help. And so this is how it ended up in the final film, where it's now him asking for help rather than someone else asking him for help. It's a great idea. Put it back in. And... This is what I was thinking. Why don't we make a fundraising page and then just add some content? You know, I thought I could even, I don't know, write like a Save the Sloth song or whatever, you know? But my point is, I need help. 
Will you help me? I'm gonna order Chinese food. Is that a yes? So now he owns that main story point. The whole story is about doing this big fundraiser. And now our main character is the one trying to get that to happen. So we've changed who owned that plot point, And I think it made it much better. Um, along the same lines, once we did change that, we had it where all the characters were sort of all together on this thing. And by the time we did our test shoot, it was still that way. So you'll see the scene. Um, and yes, I'll say ahead of time, it is very horribly written. And that's the whole point. So I'm sharing that to you. So you could learn from this. Okay, tomorrow more content, Total Barrage. Yeah, so I was thinking about that. I kind of want to do another song. I have an idea too. It's actually something I've wanted to do for a while. I mean, I, I have an idea too. Why don't we do all of them? So that's bad writing. You have a scene, everybody is agreeing, and there's no tension, nothing is moving, nothing's going through, there's no give and take or anything like that. And so again, on the page, you could write these things, oh, it's kind of cute, it's kind of fun. But then all of a sudden, you see it and you go, wow, there is no tension here. And every scene has to have some bit of a bit, uh, a tug and pull, where it kind of gets us to move forward and, and make something entertaining to watch. So you'll see that when we got to the final, um, that changed quite a bit. And what we did is we stacked it up so that in the beginning, Maxwell, the main character, wants to do this thing. He can't get any of his siblings to help. One by one, they slowly, re reluctantly help out. You're working on stuff? What, what kind of stuff are you working on? Would you guys give me a hand? I wrote you can even see how they're separated from him there. It's the two of them versus him off in the distance. So even visually speaking, it helped out there. Song for the fundraiser from the perspective of the sloth, a sloth. Okay. So will you guys help me? I have like yeah. a thousand emails like a to respond to this a lot. Yeah. Think about today. Come on! And so again, now he's begging them to help. They all say no. Eventually the brother says yes, reluctantly, if you do this other thing for me. The sister goes off. And then eventually, halfway through the film, the sister finally comes on board. So you're able to have more uh, growth happen throughout the film. And that was a big lesson that we learned. Um, we only have a time for a couple more here, and then we'll go over to Q&A. Um, and here's another one. Um, here we go. Aren't you missing work being out here, too? Uh, yeah, I'm not actually at the gallery anymore. How come? I quit. Really? Why? Because they fired me. So in that scene, we have two of the characters there, and they're talking, and it's kind of this nuanced thing. Um, and then in the table read, we actually got all three characters in there. And I'm going to show you in here that basically what happened here, there's two main jokes in here. Um, everyone's kind of all getting along once again. Um, and I'll show that to you. This guy, Lamarck, he's a total socialite pseudo-intellectual type. He got a grant of $100,000 and he hung $100,000, $1 bills all over the walls. And I punned him. Like, there was no one in the gallery, so I was like, doesn't look like the money's generating a lot of interest. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and I hung a few of his paintings upside down. They were, uh, they were up for about three days. No one noticed. Well, he eventually did. I don't know. Are you really mad? Oh, I lose some credibility there, but what you did was right and funny, so I guess it's net positive. Aww. So again, bad writing on our part. Um, it also puts the actors in a difficult position. They're all sort of gung-ho about everything. They don't really have much to work for, um, so that ends up also being difficult on them all around. So in the final one, we did a couple things. One is we added more tension once again. Um, Barney, the character here on the left, again, played by Brian McCarthy. Um, he was given a job by his sister, Jenna, played by Ava Eisenson. Um, and she's upset by it, so there's conflict there. And then Maxwell here on the right, um, played by Rich, Richard Holman. Um, he's sitting there kind of aloof from this whole situation. There's other stuff in his mind. So they're all separated in this scene. There's more tension. And on top of that, there's just one too many kind of joke 
jokes and plot points. So we took one out and just streamlined it. And this is how the final scene looks. So like one day it was just him and me there because no one was coming to see his show. And I walked up to him and I was like, it doesn't look like your money is generating a lot of interest. <laughs> ah! Don't laugh at that. It's great. You're an ingrate and you deserve to be fired for that. It's not funny. I thought you were going to say that you, um stole picture frames and then they accused you of it and you were like, no, 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 I was framed. Oh, yeah. That was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Guys, moment of silence. So again, with that, you can see a lot more tension. Everyone is, you know, literally and, and uh, symbolically on different sides of this table, all separated from each other and they all have to come together throughout the film. And so again, that's another thing that we learned from doing these tests is that you see that you come back. Um, and I remember after doing these tests, I wanted to throw up. Um, at this point, this goes back to setting the date. We were gonna be shooting, I think uh, something like three weeks after or four weeks after I came back doing this test. And I'm like, this film is really bad. Like it doesn't have enough conflict. It doesn't move fast enough. Everything feels kind of, like I said, like gung-ho, like everyone's like, woohoo, let's go do these things. And it wasn't moving. And by doing this test, we're able to learn that, make changes and come back. And by the time we shot, I felt very confident with the script. And I was excited to had a chance to do all these tests to understand what we had. So by the time we filmed it, I felt like we had a good story with the right amount of conflict and uh, had something that, um, that I'm now proud of. Um, and that'll basically be it. I'll just bring up one more point in regards to that. Um, our sloth used to be a bird that was in a cage in a home and for multiple reasons. Oh, actually, I was not sharing my screen, I'm sorry. Um, so it, was, it used to be a bird in the cage that was talking to him. And then for multiple reasons, we ended up uh, making it a sloth um, out in like this forest that's next to the house, which made it much more mystical. It was a much better creature. It was more symbolic to the story of this main character moving slowly in his life. And we made him all dream sequences where he steps out there versus kind of this um, out of his mind moment of talking to a bird inside the house. And again, all this stuff came from testing and working on that. So that is it. Um, you know, just to sum it all up is if you want to make a movie, get out and make a movie. It's one way or another, just get out and do it. That's the most important thing. Don't wait around. Um, you know, everyone always uh, keeps on changing the rules of the game and finding what new ways to do it. They shoot it on their iPhone or they shoot it with a webcam or they just get some friends together and they do it as a single person or with a small group of people. But no matter what, if you want to do a micro budget film, use some of this advice. Uh, you know, I'll paste here some of those um, references that I mentioned in the chat window. Um, so you could also do some research on your own. At the very, very bottom, there's a link to my website uh, with a slash screenplay. At the very, very bottom of that link, you'll see the resources and hyperlinks to it and things like that. So, and that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Brad. It was a really an exciting lecture, an inspiring lecture, most of all. And thank you very much. And I hope all the, I mean, the audience uh, has enjoyed it. And uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, uh, how do you manage to get your first jig as a director? Amazing work, by the way. Thank you for that. Um, I can answer this. I need to kind of expand on it too. I got my first gig by just doing my first project. And that also goes to each step in the career. So when I first wanted to make music videos, I just went out and made smaller music videos. And by doing one for free or even spending money on it, then you have someone that says, hey, we would love for you to do a video for us. We have no budget, but we'd love it to be an official video. So all of a sudden now you have a free gig for an official video. Then someone sees that and it says, oh, we love that. We have a small budget and you get the small budget. Then someone sees that and says, we have a big budget. So you kind of work your way up this way. And each time that I've had to kind of change my careers, including right now, moving from commercials into feature films, I've had to start that process over again. As you just saw, I set out and do a feature film without a big studio behind me, without a big budget, um, just a Kickstarter style film. And so I could prove to people, say, hey, I'm able to do this, watch what I could do. And then I'm hoping the next one will be a low budget feature and from there a bigger budget feature and it goes bigger and bigger um, each step of the way and kind of builds up. So my answer all in all is just go out and do it. 
if you don't have equipment, at least you can get a phone, at least you have your computer, make something, create something, learn from it, get better, share it with people, and do that over and over again until you just kind of work your way up. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from Faith. How did the Fabrica help you along on your journey of filmmaking? Um, I went to um, business school, um, but when I was at university, I was also making my own films and shorts, and I started doing some uh, one person shooting type things where you shoot, produce and edit and deliver for some TV networks. And so that's what I was doing. Um, so I never had any formal education in film. When I got to Fabrica, which also does not have any formal education with it, what you do have is this team of people from all around the world with all their different likes and dislikes and their different uh, abilities. And when you work on a project and pitch on a project, you're getting a few different things. You're getting their artistic sensibilities and their process. You're getting their sensibilities as somebody from a, a different country, a different culture from around the world. And you kind of understand how your culture might uh, work with that or kind of clash with it when it comes to what your comedy is like, or your drama is like. And from there, so between the international side and just these amazing artists, it was basically kind of a, a thing by osmosis where by, by picking all this up from everyone, it helped out a lot. And then Fabrica itself set up the opportunities for us to do things. So for example, my very first commercial was for the World, World Health Organization. And that's something that we all wrote and then directed. And then we did uh, all the posts at Fabrica as well. Um, we did stuff with the Central Pompidou uh, where we did different exhibits. So it, it gave us the, the access and the opportunity to create things for a bigger audience and for bigger clients and to do things like that. Thank you. I agree with you. I mean, <laughs> Fabrica is really a special place. And a last question. Uh, I know it's an impossible question, but how to try to understand if a low budget script will work? Um, I will, there's kind of a few answers to that. One is you should get out and just film things on your own anyways, um, before you try to do that full feature film. If this is your very first project, do something smaller so you can understand how the mechanisms work. So for example, if you want to do one scene from your film or a short film, or a project like that, you'll kind of understand what you need or don't need for a project. Then from there, you'll be able to understand, okay, now as I extrapolate this out, and this one scene turns into 50 scenes, what will I actually need to get this done? So that's one thing that helps. Another thing is to, to read, you know, some of these re resources that I mentioned, uh, such as like Rebel Without a Crew or Independent Ed, and really understand how they broke it down and how they did these things. Once you see their crew size, their methodology, uh, the limited locations and things like that, you'll kind of understand, okay, I could see how this could apply to my script. Um, but as you go through your script and you kind of take a look at each thing, you could really understand, okay, does this seem um, too big for this or not and things like that, but basically test out smaller projects, understand it, and then try to apply that to the bigger one and then best of luck. <laughs> okay, I see one more, you, I see one more here if I don't, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, um, ask uh, the beginning friendly post production editing software you might recommend. So somebody was asking about the software and and stuff that they would recommend. Um, what I'd recommend is anything you feel comfortable with. Really, um, there is uh, a lot of stuff out there. The industry standard for feature films and for narrative and episodic is Avid. Um, a lot of one stop shops moved over to Premiere, and which is also now used for more commercials and also feature films, and I cut this on Premiere, and Final Cut X or Final Cut Pro got a very bad reputation because they released it too soon before it was really ready for prime time, but now I'm actually hearing a lot of people that enjoy that too. So I'd recommend doing any of those. If you want to completely stay independent, you could do Final Cut um, and do that on your own and kind of learn that way, but if you also think you want to get hired as an editor, then things that are like Premiere or Avid might be a better path to take because after you learn those, you could also get hired to do them. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Brad, for this inspiring lecture, and we hope you all enjoy it.
And the next appointment with the Fabrica Creative Labs series is a lecture by Andy Smith, an American writer and created on April 21st at three. And if you wanted to be updated about our initiatives and events in Fabrica, you can subscribe our newsletter or follow us in our social media channels. So thank you everybody again and see you next week.